Malaysia City volunteers distribute needed items to the flood affected residents. A Malaysian Jingsia Bo lay practitioner dedicates to conduct disaster relief globally. Welcome to the headlines, I'm Maggie Tai. Thank you for joining us. After flooding happened in Kuala Lumpur, city volunteers immediately distributed aid materials to the affected residents, inspiring them to pay back by donating money to help others. Flooding occurred in Sakapundalan, Kuala Lumpur. After assessing the damage, GG volunteers started aid distribution immediately. <laughs> Although Zaji does not believe in Islam, they are the first and earliest organization to arrive at the affected area to help us. We need to be grateful to them. I'm very grateful for Zaji's assistance. For the blanket I got today, I'll use it tonight because it is very cold. Nobody ever came to help us before. This is the first time we got assistance, together with a lot of supporting materials. I am very happy. Someone came to help them relieving some of their burdens. A man of other race is very touched by our action to care for them, regardless of races and religions. The on-site volunteers introduced a con bank to the affected residents, who took out money to donate immediately. At the distribution site, volunteers adhere to the principles of carrying out relief work, directness, priority, respect, practicality and timeliness to help the affected people go through their difficulties. Chen Xiaomei from Pingdong fundraised for her grandson's cancer treatment by selling her artwork. Now that her grandson has passed, she hopes to keep his spirit alive by donating her artworks to charity and also encouraging others to register as donors. This warm greeting has finally brought a smile to 60-year-old Chen Xiaomei's face as her grandson has just passed away from cancer. When he was sick, we were referred from the community hospital to the Kaohsiung Medical University Hospital. We stayed there for three years. Crying didn't help, but not crying didn't help either. I really didn't know what to do. The grandson's condition was up and down at times. When it was bad, she would draw or make a bitty craft to divert her attention. Her 11-year-old grandson had leukemia and medical expenses for seven days was as high as near 20,000 U.S. dollars. In order to pay the bills, Chen Xiaomei painted and made beaded crafts. In moments of despair, Sisi volunteers appeared. Today, if Sister Yang Mingxun and Brother Li Boixi weren't there for me each step of the way, I would honestly have a more difficult time. I think she is very brave. She has continued to upload a positive attitude and no matter what kind of the obstacle she faced, she's always looking for a solution. Not only donating her drawings for auction, she promises to share her story at Mirror Registry Drives to encourage more people to sign up and save a life. There's an Obu to Saba called Huang Weimin in Taichung. He's, she's now retired and has devoted herself to Ciji. Apart from volunteering at a nursing home, she also helps sewing puppet costumes. Huang Weimin, who helps sewing the second-hand clothing, is 70 years old already. Although she needs to rely on a guy to thread a little at her age, she is often happy to take the drop. <laughs> The clothes of the puppet that Chi volunteer Huang Jinfu is holding is made from Huang Weiming. At the end of that year, she even made a set of puppet costumes. I help him to make some puppet costumes, no matter if they're clothes or hats. The hats I made were very pretty. Uh, Huang Weiming is also a volunteer at a nursing home. She takes a train to the nursing home every Tuesday. She treats the residents here just like her family. I called her sister, mother, and auntie. She does everything seriously. She comes here to serve these old Buddhist very well. 
Huang Weimin has been serving here for nearly four years. Although she is of similar age as the seniors here and also the old Buddhist, she dedicated her second life after retirement to serve the community. Time waits for no man. I'll still get old if I'm not staying here. I come out to entertain them and they also make me happy. Tochiji is the hometown of strawberries and in recent years, because of global warming, farmers have to use air-conditioned rooms to grow strawberries 24 hours a day. However, in winter, they can also grow strawberries, meaning year-round production. Additionally, new varieties have also been developed. This instrument measures the resistance of a strawberry. It inserts a probe and we are able to judge the strawberry from the exterior surface and the fruit density here with data. This is the place in Japan which knows the most about domestic strawberries. After a large series of tests measuring the sweetness and acidity of strawberries, there's also a chance for people to eat strawberries. These lab workers record data about what they eat, on average consuming more than 4,000 strawberries a year, almost 80 times the 50 strawberries an average person eats a year. When strawberries are nearly the size of a palm, and this appearance is not the type of fruit that we generally expect. This is the Strawberry Research Center in Tochichi Prefecture. It is also the only strawberry research institute in Japan. Every time a new variety is developed, 10,000 strawberry bushes will be planted. The general growing season of strawberries in Taiwan is about one to two months in winter. But the research center has succeeded in making strawberries grow in all seasons, even white varieties. This year's production period is six times that of normal strawberries. The rest station in the prefecture also offers strawberries. The strawberries here come from particular farms that have detailed production history. Strawberries have 70 years of history in Tochigi, with annual output topping more than 25,000 tons a year. This is 15 percent of the country's total production, which is worth 262 million U.S. dollars, tops in Japan for 22 consecutive years. This rest station, our seasonal strawberry turnover is 1.1 million U.S. dollars. It's incredible that a small rest station can sell a million U.S. dollars of strawberries. It is little wonder that this whole prefecture takes strawberry production very seriously. There are literally dozens of strawberry farms in the area. We'll soon meet a third-generation strawberry farmer. I want to use the strawberry to communicate with all kinds of people. Just a simple strawberry can make people smile. I want to use this type of communication to spread my message to a wider audience around the world. Strawberries grown in greenhouses using organic farming methods can be eaten directly. There are a total of eight strawberry types in this greenhouse, which is often a place for students to come for instruction outside of school. However, Tochiki Prefecture, which has a history of 70 years of strawberry planting, has also experienced the effects of climate warming in recent years. Now strawberries are more likely to become sick with disease. When the temperature is higher than 25 degrees, it is easier this disease to spread. Although most strawberries are grown in greenhouses, pests and diseases are becoming more and more serious due to weather conditions. Tochigi Prefecture is actively developing new varieties to meet this challenge. To grow strawberries in all seasons is one goal, but the next one is to strengthen the yield as well as greater resistance to pests and diseases. Because of global warming, it is more difficult to produce strawberries as we work hard to develop new varieties that can survive. With global warming and more extreme climate, the fate of the global food production system is unstable, and Asia and Japan are no exception. 
育ったがあったんですね。で、それをまあ農家はやっぱり。Hokkaido people also want to eat rice, so there is a section of farmers who have bugged the train in research and production of rice. Professor Tanaka is 61 years old and has studied rice cultivation in Hokkaido for more than 35 years. Global warming has allowed Hokkaido, which wasn't a suitable place for growing rice, has become a major producer of Japan's rice production in recent years. Rice originally liked high temperature, with global warming good for rice production in Hokkaido. After discovering that the climate is getting warmer, Professor Tanaka is more active in improving rice cultivation. This rice is eaten by mice because it is so delicious. This is the original Hantan species of black rice. We mated these two kinds to produce Yume Prika. The emergence of a new variety takes about seven or eight years after mating, but we tested about 100 different varieties in the laboratory every year. This is the rice mill in Fukagara city. Most farmers will send rice here. Such a bag is 1,020 kilograms of white rice. Here, they have already stored more than 3,000 bags. This public rice mill has all of the rice milling business in the city. More than 3,000 tons of white rice are here in front of us, which is the full harvest from Fukagawa city. But this warehouse is only half full, as it was originally a storage facility for war. There are more than 20,000 people in Fukagawa city, and this warehouse is a three-day supply for 5,000 people. Each batch of rice entering the rice mill will be tested and analyzed. It only takes a few seconds before the results come out. Climate warming has made Hokkaido a place suitable for rice farming. They are also moving towards becoming a major supplier for Japan's rice. 50-year-old Chen Su-ji was diagnosed with acumenoid leukemia but was later on cure from bone marrow transplantation. Her daughter Lin Hongzhi, who is 40 years old, used to be a lymphoma patient. After recovering, Chen Su-jin gives back by caring for other patients. Giving the hand-painted pomelo to the patients, Chen Su-jin went to the hospital to cheer the patients up. I can understand their feelings as patients, since I used to be one of them. Fifty years old, Chen Su Qing underwent bone marrow transplantation for her acute myeloid leukemia seven years ago. I am very grateful to my donor, who donated peripheral blood stem cells to me, allowing me to reborn and see this beautiful world again. After recovery, Chen Su Qing assisted in promoting blood testing for peripheral blood stem cell donation and visited the hospital with Su Qing bone marrow donation care team to care for the patient regularly. Bring also the love from the donor, she goes with us to care for the new patients and encourage them with her own successful story, making them find a hope in their life. The donor Lin Hongzhi, who is 48 years old, is the one brings her hope. His mother is a member of Tsuji. My mother asked me to do the blood test. Later on, when I was informed of a successful matching, since it was during holiday, I asked him to give me a week to make the decision. His wife just recovered from lymphoma at the time and encouraged him to make the donation. He told me that if his wife agreed, he would make the donation. Since his wife understands the pain and struggles as a patient, she wished her husband could help other patients as well. When my wife was ill, she has received a lot of blood from donors, and now I would like to reciprocate by giving back to those in need. Lin Hongzhi never brags about his donation, but seeing all of this was his destiny. Bone marrow transplantation connects two strangers. The recipient now has the same blood in her body, and the donor feels content for his donation. I want to thank the donor for saving my daughter's life. Thank you very much for your help. 
In the prime of his life, he learned to put others ahead of his own needs and given wholeheartedly to the betterment of others. He is among the first group lay practitioners of the Jinsi Bow to receive certification this year. His Dharma name is Si Yu, and he is originally from Malaysia. Let's further hear his story. I'm originally from Malaysia and I moved to Singapore in 2000 to work and got to know Ziji in 2002. Then the 2004 tsunami really affected me. You could say it was a turning point in my life. I felt life's impermanence and asked myself, what is it that I really want? The first time he stepped foot onto Sri Lanka, lay practitioner Si Yu was in his early 30s. He's excited to see me each time and will run towards me. I'm happy when I see him too, as it's like seeing my own child. His initial aspiration took him to Myanmar, when the 2008 cyclone Nargis devastated the land. He was among the first group of city volunteers to help Myanmar. The local volunteers are very inspiring. They actually pick up everything that Tsuji volunteers are doing and will do it alongside us, sometimes even doing it better. We often say if we delayed our mission a little, then we would have had nothing left to do. Helping Myanmar restore itself from zero became his main focus. When the Sichuan earthquake happened, he was appointed to head to the front lines for relief work. Wow. <laughs> Honestly, back then, I didn't want to go to Sichuan. I knew if I went to Sichuan, I could never return to Myanmar. When I left Myanmar, I wrote that I left my heart in Irrawaddy. It wasn't until the master said to me, there are disaster victims in Sichuan, just like there are in Myanmar. Why don't you seize the opportunity for giving when you can? It was the master's wisdom that motivated me to go willingly. And when I stepped in the disaster zone in Sichuan, I finally understood what the master meant. I realized the Master sent us not to help them in terms of material aid, but for emotional and spiritual support. When a disaster happens, an outpouring of love reaches the victims, with many volunteers willing to come. However, how many of them have the determination to stay? The importance of Ziji is that we plant love, which then inspires the locals to foster that love. I feel like seeds of compassion have been planted. And it's the kind of sowing that doesn't require reciprocation. It's like my world has been opened suddenly. <laughs> Traveling through different countries in relief support, Si Yu never felt like a foreigner. Eleven years later, his definition of home has not changed. Many times value lies in what you have given as opposed to you specific as a person. Take us lay practitioner, for instance, we are not valued as an individual but rather as a group. Master Zheng Yan formed the Ziji Foundation in the early days. With those 30 housewives, people are more likely to remember the spirit of 30 housewives than each member individually. Becoming the first batch of lay practitioners at the Jin Sobo to receive certification, he speaks softly and has a gentle demeanor. He looks at things lightly because he feels passionate about it. His intentions are pure and compassionate filled. However, this is all normal for lay practitioners like him, as this is just the first step in this journey with no end.
In Malaysia, senior Ka Wufar Far Grandpa once worked in construction sites but lost his arm in a work injury. Since then, he has been living a hard life. Since volunteers provided him with living subsidies to give back, he does recycling and save money to help others. I used to work in a construction site. Since a piece of wood was broken, I fell down from 18 feet above. Fortunately, I'm still alive. Wu Fa Fa's grandpa lost one of his arms in a work injury 34 years ago. If I have only one arm left for work, how could I still be happy? At that time, I wanted to commit suicide by taking drugs. However, I thought of my family. I gave up eventually. Grandpa has no choice but to resign from the high-paying building work. Collecting trash can earn about at most 2.5 US dollars a day. Grandpa insists on doing it just to earn a living for his family of three. Although using only one hand is quite struggling, Grandpa is resolute in sorting the trash carefully because this can make more money. He also needs to take care of two nearly 60-year-old children with mental illnesses. In 2010, Chiji volunteers start to know Grandpa's family and learn about his hard life. They decided to provide living subsidy to him. Being a satisfied person, Grandpa only accepted part of the subsidy. Chiji volunteers respected his wish and went to care for him regularly. He wants to do more work, hoping to earn more money for his children. Since neither of them is sensible, Grandpa worries about their future very much. Nevertheless, he always smiles. Today we saw his kids begin to help his father. It seems that the situation has improved. In 2005, Chiji helped fund rising on the street for South Asia tsunami. It was the first time for Chiji volunteers to seek donations from Wu Fa for Grandpa. Because we hope that everyone could have the opportunity to create blessings, even though he's a beggar. So we encourage Grandpa to donate as much as he could. I didn't even have enough money to buy food. How could I donate? I still have to raise two children with mental illnesses. I said to him, it doesn't matter, or I'll give you a dollar so you can donate. Eventually, he donated what we gave him. Apart from family members, Chiji volunteers are the friends he wants to see most. Volunteers' visits allows him to rest for a while. He felt that he was so poor and unable to help others originally. But now he began to realize that helping others is not the privilege of the rich. Grandpa can only donate one US dollars every month, which is already the reward for recycling 50 kilograms of paper. Since I can still work, I can donate as much as I can to help others. Although he only has one arm left, he looks like a living Buddha suffered for his doing good deeds. Taoyuan City Dementia Center hosted the seventh anniversary musical concert in Tainan and many seniors sing and dance on the stage. Let's join them and see you next time.